Hello and welcome to this special broadcast here on India today that we're bringing to you on the front line between Israel and the Palestinian territories. Behind me is a crossing point that gets into the West Bank and within sight is the city of Jenin. That is the place where the Israeli Defense Forces struck in a rare act of offense just a couple of days ago. On this special broadcast, I'm going to be bringing you everything, including a special ground report on the threshold of Jenin, where Israel expected Hamas to conduct a second big attack, opening a third big front. Israel opens new front in war. Rare aerial attack on West Bank Mosque. India today at Israel's third front. World exclusive from Jenin doorstep. First reporter near airstrike site. I'm standing here on the threshold of Jenin. It's a city in the West Bank. The roadside behind you tells you which direction it is, and that is the West Bank. We're the first Indian crew right here at the doorstep of Janine, which we're going to try and get into. Shivaru in the war zone. Over the last 24 hours, I've traveled to the south of Israel, and now we're in the West Bank. And I can tell you that... On the front lines of Gaza, even though a ground operation is not happening, the devastation wrought by the Hamas terrorist group is writ large. I visited some of the worst affected areas to bring you these reports. I'm standing here on the threshold of Jenin. It's a city in the West Bank. The roadside behind you tells you which direction it is. And that is the West Bank, with the first Indian crew right here at the doorstep of Janine, which we're going to try and get into. But I want to tell you a little bit more about Janine at this point of time. This is a place that has been struck by an airstrike just a couple of days ago for only the second time in over two decades. Now, the West Bank, much of which is uh, under Israeli administration, has pockets under the Palestinian Authority. Jenin has been conspicuously notorious through the entire history of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Now, Jenin is not only a place that has been struck by an airstrike where the Al-Ansar Mosque, just about a couple of kilometers in that direction, that's Jenin you see right there, in that direction is where the airstrike took place, uh, but it's also a place where more airstrikes will happen. I spoke a couple of days ago uh, to one of the lead spokespersons of the Israeli Defense Forces, and this entire territory is still under Israel, and they say more airstrikes might happen. The difference between Gaza and Jenin is that Gaza is under Hamas, Jenin is under a political party called Fatah, which is uh, a rival party of the Hamas. Now, the Fatah, which uh, constitutes the Palestinian Authority, has not been able to exercise much control over what happens in this part of the West Bank, which is northern Gen uh, the northern part of the West Bank in Jenin, which has this refugee camp, which was finally struck in that airstrike. This particular airstrike uh, takes place on the Al-Ansar Mosque because, incredibly, Israel believes that plans were afoot by an emboldened Hamas to conduct a similar terrorist attack from Jenin on Israeli territory uh, 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 using the same kinds of resources, paragliders, rockets, missiles, that kind of thing. And that's one of the reasons why they took the difficult decision to conduct an airstrike uh, in Jenin. Jenin has many different names. Among Palestinians, it's called the martyr's capital. Among Israelis, it's called the hornet's nest because it has been a bedrock and a haven for many of the extremist groups uh, uh, among the Palestinians, including the Al-Quds, which is the, the, the military wing of the, uh, of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. The Jenin is also home uh, to the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, which is the military faction of the Fatah political party. But 2023 has actually seen much, much more happening in Jenin. Uh, it's a place where the Israelis, uh, Israeli defense forces don't like to venture in because it's a, 
like, very much like Gaza. It's a heavily populated area. Uh, as you can see, even from this distance, uh, Jenin is a is a pretty crowded area. Somewhere right above that hill uh, is the is the refugee camp as well, and it's a difficult place to administer. And that's the reason why is uh, the Israel Defense Forces have very rarely gone inside Jenin. Uh, but earlier this year. We did see some fighting taking place where there were a, a lot of casualties. Last year, an Al Jazeera journalist was famously shot dead uh, in what became a global controversy as well. So Jenin continues to be a hot spot. It's over 70 years old. It's one of the first refugee camps that came up, but it continues to be a hot spot as far as terror against Israel is concerned. In Jenin, in the West Bank, Shivarur for India Today. As the first journalist on the threshold of Jenin, India today has been told that we are just about a kilometer and a half from where that airstrike took place on Sunday morning. The Al Ansar Mosque was struck, and not many people know that Jenin is considered the second most restive Palestinian territory after Gaza. And it was from here that the Hamas was expected to launch perhaps another strike, opening another front against Israel. And that's why breaking many, many years of tradition, Israel decided to conduct an airstrike in the West Bank at the Jenin refugee camp. Amid the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas, Israel opened a fresh front in its offensive. In a major escalation, Israeli forces carried out their first major airstrike in the West Bank. Israel struck a compound beneath Al Ansar Mosque in the West Bank's Jenin, killing at least one person. The Israeli forces said the mosque conceals terror cells of Hamas and Islamic Jihad. The terror groups have been using the mosque as a command center to plan terror attacks. Based on specific intelligence inputs, the Israeli forces mounted an airstrike even in the West Bank targeting the Al Ansar Mosque, saying Hamas terrorists were not just hiding in the mosque but were also storing weapons for an imminent attack on Israeli civilians. <laughs> As the war reaches the West Bank, so far dozens of Palestinian radicals in West Bank have been killed in clashes with Israeli forces. Israel's airstrike on the Al Ansar Mosque in the West Bank shows that the beast has woken and it's going to go after every single asset of the Hamas. A hyper alert intelligence is going to make sure that Operation Swords of Iron is not going to stop at anything whatsoever. And this also means that two big fronts are now completely open. The West Bank strikes come after Israel conducted multiple raids in the region, arresting hundreds of Hamas workers and seizing massive cash of arms and ammunition aimed at attacking Israel. With Gaurav Savant and Shivarur from Israel, Bureau Report, India Today. The Jenin refugee camp has a particularly notorious reputation in the Israel-Palestine conflict. It was started in 1953 and since then it has proven to be a haven for many of the most extremist Palestinian groups and the military wings of mainstream Palestinian political parties. But 2023 has meant that Hamas, unlike the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, which already have a firm foundation in Jenin, the Hamas has recently found greater strength within a territory that was thus far not very friendly to it. And that's the reason why Jenin holds an extremely significant place in the history of this conflict and this time as well. Jenin a small city north of the West Bank contains a teeming refugee camp that shelters more than 24,000 people. Most of the inhabitants of Jenin refugee camp are descendants of Palestinians dispossessed when Israel was created in 1948. Most are impoverished and unemployed. Jenin produced many of the suicide bombers who spearheaded the Intifada or uprising against Israel. The city witnessed some of the worst bloodshed during the second Intifada, which began after the collapse of US-backed peace talks 
in 2000. In 2002, the army besieged the camp for more than a month amid fierce fighting that killed 52 Palestinians and 23 Israeli soldiers. Two decades on, amid the escalating war with Hamas in the Gaza Strip, Israel says the Jenin camp is still a hub for planning and preparing of terror attacks. Tel Aviv claims the Jenin refugee camp is a safe haven for fighters funded by Hamas. Al-Ansar Mosque, bombed by Israeli Defense Forces, is one such hideout, according to Tel Aviv. Bureau Report, India Today. The big development today has been the release of uncensored footage from the body cams of Hamas terrorists that were recorded during the October 7th massacre. Israel had hesitated to release this footage thus far, but now seeing the narrative around the world and the pressure building on Israel, the government decided it needs to put out that information to remind the world about the barbarities that have been perpetrated by Hamas terrorists on the Israeli people on October the 7th. International journalists here in Israel were invited to a big screening where they saw without their phones, without any recording equipment, what those body cams of those terrorists actually saw. Take a look at this report. The cameras. As we work to defeat the terror organization that brutalized our people, we are witnessing a Holocaust denial-like phenomenon evolving in real time. Hamas terrorists went on a killing frenzy as the October 7th siege unfolded. This video shows Hamas seek out an in The kibbutz in southern Israel bears testament to the true horrors of Hamas. This was probably a preschool for kids. The doodles and paintings on walls now covered by bullet marks. So uh, this isn't a replica, this is an actual uh, rocket that has been recovered after a particular attack. Uh, obviously we're told uh, that we can't touch any of the rockets that land here in Sderot because uh, there are booby traps, many of them are misfired rockets so they may not have exploded. Uh, but this is actually what it looks like, it's a pretty heavy thing. Uh, many such, uh, uh, you know, many such debris are already there uh, and are part of investigation but this kind of know-how uh, you know, you can see the tail fins, you can see the booster module, uh, the, you know, the, the very thick metallic fabrication shows that uh, the, the Hamas has been able to garner this kind of know-how sitting inside Gaza. They do get rocket uh, technology from Iran as well, but the know-how to convert everyday metal tubes from pipes, etc. into usable rockets that have wrought so much devastation uh, is, a, is a matter of great concern, especially since Hamas is able to make these kinds of rockets sitting inside Gaza using the sending al some rockets still into Israel. The big focus continues to remain the 200, uh, 200 hostages that uh, are still inside the Gaza Strip in the captivity of the Hamas. So they're all, uh, you know, perhaps in some of the buildings that you can see in these pictures. We don't know. Are they in the north? Are they in the south? There is no idea. Uh, the fact that two hostages were released has actually piled on the tension and suspense over what's going to really happen. Because the big question continues to be, if this is phase one, what is phase two and phase three going to look like? Are negotiations really happening where the non-military hostages from Gaza will all be released very quickly? We don't know just yet, but in the interim at least, while that attains a semblance of clarity, Israel is not backing off, not even an inch, not even for a minute. We're reporting now from Kibbutz Beri, uh, which is one of the closest uh, agricultural communes to the Gaza Strip. Uh, this uh, is a kibbutz where the destruction is not only apparent, but the void that's been left behind is particularly uh, devastating. Over a hundred people were massacred uh, by the Hamas right here at this particular kibbutz. The destruction is very, very plain to see, but worse than that, over a hundred hostages were taken from just this one kibbutz, which means that over a hundred of uh, 200 plus hostages that are currently in Gaza in the captivity of the Hamas terrorist group are from this kibbutz alone. Uh, the destruction is not just in terms of 
you know, the little pieces of houses that you can see here. But the damage has been devastating uh, pretty much throughout the kibbutz. Uh, lots of farms and fields have been destroyed as a result of rocket fire. Uh, as you can see, huge amount of structural damage to all of the structures here at this particular kibbutz. Uh, and as we continue to report here, uh, the Israel army has uh, completely come in and taken over. They've got tanks stationed outside. They've got a lot of personnel uh, deployed here who are uh, obviously uh, going to be here. Uh, none of the people who survived, obviously, are still at this kibbutz, but uh, hopefully they will make their way back at some point of time. But uh, it's just destruction as far as the eye can see in Kibbutz Perry. Israel actually took another step which is also very interesting and serves as a kind of precursor to what's going to happen today. They invited international journalists to the, uh, the world-renowned forensic laboratory here in Israel to inspect for themselves the post-mortem reports and some of the remains. There were small bags of body parts some of them actually got a chance to see slides uh, you know of those parts removed so they actually got to see what happened to hundreds of these Israelis who were butchered on October the 7th. So it creates a mood, it creates a narrative, it puts the facts on the ground. Israel has so far held back on releasing too much information about what happened on October the 7th. But now it believes that the international pressure has gotten a little too much. Even President Biden has been repeatedly cautioning about what's happening in Gaza. He's released, uh, you know, aid into Palestine. He's talked about a two-state solution. So Israel believes, even though it has its allies, international support for more violence is running a little thin. And that's why it needs to create a case. And by putting out these shocking, unbridled, uncensored pictures, it believes the world will once again be reminded of what happened on October the 7th, and therefore a mood could be created to support what's coming next. Well, the release of body cam footage over two weeks after uh, the Hamas terrorist attack on October the 7th uh, is Israel creating a case and reminding the world of the barbarity that was unleashed by Hamas terrorists, uh, you know, resulting in the deaths of 1,400 civilians uh, and many hostages being taken as well. Uh, Israel, remember, has been watching, uh, you know, with a sense of dismay, the kind of narratives that have been built in other parts of the world, especially in the Arab world. Uh, you know, they acknowledge calls for, uh, you know, uh, calls for calm amidst a humanitarian crisis in Gaza, but they have resolutely stood by their right to defend themselves and avenge the deaths of all those, uh, you know, who were killed by the Hamas. Uh, therefore, the release of body cam footage, which we are told, uh, 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 and uh, uh, according to our sources within the system, uh, uncensored, horrifying, unedited footage recorded from the GoPro body cams that the Hamas terrorists wore when they went about their massacre and killing spree is going to be perhaps the most, uh, you know, jarring, uh, most, uh, you know, most terrifying case that Israel can actually make, uh, uh, you know, for what it has been doing so far in terms of airstrikes and what it proposes to do as far as the decimation of Hamas is concerned. Remember, we've heard the worst of humanity over the last few days uh, and weeks. Uh, you know, butchered babies, families burnt alive, the elderly, uh, you know, uh, tortured, people tied up and burnt in their houses. I've been visiting kibbutzes where, uh, you know, the destruction has been plain to see. Therefore, I think the body cam footage is Israel saying, I think the world needs a reminder of why we need to do this. Hostilities on Israel's northern border with Lebanon by the Hezbollah, cruise missiles uh, launched by the Houthi uh, militants in Yemen, both big proxies of Iran mean that this has already become an international conflict. Uh, uh, the United States deployment uh, in the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean Sea means that this is already a West Asian crisis that involves other countries beyond just Israel and Palestine. And that's the reason why uh, Every next step holds the potential for a catastrophic miscalculation. What if Israel gets, uh, what if Iran uh, is forced to get involved directly? What if, uh, uh, you know, the conventional weapons belonging to the Hezbollah are used in a much larger way, uh, you know, much more than just the kind of pinprick text testing that's just happening uh, on the northern borders with Lebanon? All of these factors mean that Israel is fully prepared. We've been speaking to the IDF. We spent an entire day with them at the Kibbutz Berry in South uh, Israel yesterday. And I can tell you that the entire situation 
uh, is on tenterhooks at this point of time. And Israel is hoping that it doesn't need to open another front in the north. It doesn't want to go to war with Iran, but they say if they're forced to do so, they will. The United States is sending missile defense technology to bolster its strength in the region. They've sent two big, giant aircraft carrier battle groups into the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean. But the U.S. is doing a whole lot more, except that it isn't really black and white. It's actually complicated because the United States isn't only doing this for Israel because American support for Israel is hardwired into bipartisan American politics. In fact, the United States is doing this much more for itself. Take a look at this report. Strikes to punish provocations by the Hezbollah, the Iran-backed group, that has carefully scaled up hostilities, opening up a war front on Israel's northern border. Days ago, a U.S. warship's air defense system intercepted a battery of cruise missiles launched by Iran-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen, south of Israel. What's clear is that in under 20 days, the Israel-Hamas war has exploded into a full West Asian crisis that could spiral into a global conflict. The United States of America, which has already deployed two giant aircraft carrier battle groups to the Mediterranean and Persian Gulf, has also decided to bolster advanced missile defense capabilities on the region. In its latest move, the Biden administration has decided to deploy additional terminal high-altitude air defense and Patriot anti-missile systems in the general area of Israel as a shield against an increasingly belligerent Iran. The rationing up of tensions means Iran is on notice with relations back to square one just weeks after the Biden administration had arrived at an elusive breakthrough with Iran, even unblocking billions in aid. Israel, which has rejected concerns of an expanding conflict, has said it will do what it must to defend itself <laughs> and went to the massacre of 7th October. Could the world be staring at a new mini-world war? With Shivarur in Israel, Bureau Report, India Today. Over two weeks into this crisis, and you can only imagine the kind of anger that is built among the families of the hostages that continue to be in the captivity of the Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Two hostages have been released, but many more continue to be in Hamas captivity. Their condition is unknown. Remember, the Hamas has only ever released one video of one particular hostage. Where are the others? What is their condition? Are all of them indeed alive? That number is 212. I spent some time with the relatives and friends of some of these hostages in the heart of Tel Aviv. And this is what they said. This is what they told me, a reflection of the anger, the dismay, the desperation among families for their loved ones. Freedom now! Freedom now! Freedom now! This is downtown Tel Aviv, the capital of Israel, and it is completely drowned out by the sound of angry Israelis who've collected here demanding justice for the hostages who continue to be in the captivity of Hamas more than two weeks after the dreaded terror attack by that terrorist group from Gaza on October the 7th. I want to take you into this crowd because something like this can never be staged. Amidst this crowd you see over here are families, there are friends, there are relatives, there are people who've come from far-flung places, people from places like Portugal, people from Singapore, people from all over the world have actually gathered and many of them are here today. So I'm going to take you into that crowd to show you what it really feels like, perhaps right now, to be an Israeli. We're in the middle of a protest here in Tel Aviv where all of these people are asking for 
a full prisoner deal. All of the people here are extremely angry and they're saying that the government here has not been doing enough to bring the hostages back. Many of the people here are friends, relatives, classmates, parents, uh, siblings of those who've been kidnapped. They're all holding posters and they're all calling for the Israeli government to instantly, to instantly act and they believe, some of them at least believe, that a ceasefire is the only way to actually bring it up. But one thing binds all of them, it's despair, it's anger, and they're raising their voice in the most visible central part of Israel's capital, Tel Aviv. I'm Ayelet, I'm in the Idan's aunt. Idan is missing since uh, Saturday, October 7th, and we haven't heard from him. We, we just had a phone call to his, his girlfriend on Saturday morning, and since then we don't know anything. We want answers. I think the entire world needs to give us answers. <laughs> No sign to Idan. There is. It's 15 days that we didn't hear from him. All the world need to understand. This is more than a war crime. What Hamas did, did there. It's a. It's a crime against humanity. And all their leaders around the world need to intervene to, to take action. Uh, Idan also have a, a Portuguese citizenship, and we are in contact with the Portuguese uh, government and the embassy. And we ask from all the leaders around the world, all the people, to spread it and to know it, to know the true Hamas killed their babies and uh, old men. This is uh, what happened there. <laughs> Hashem Shomrecha, Hashem Tidcha, Al Yad Yeminecha. Shir Amalot, Esa Enay El Arim, Me'ayin Yabo Ezri, Ezri Me'im Hashem. Shemish <laughs> On India today, as we report from the West Bank and from Israel, remember it's the children that are caught in the crossfire. Children who were butchered by Hamas terrorists and children who are dying as part of an expanding humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip. Here in India today, we have a clarion call on both sides. Save the children. The horrors of this war the terrible price of this conflict. is always paid by the smallest. <laughs> After the demonic Hamas terror attack, <laughs> and Israel's unforgiving vengeance, It's the children of both sides who are paying. Yeah. 
India today stands with the innocent. Join us as we say to the world, save the children. Kafir is barely nine months old and the youngest to remain in Hamas captivity for over two weeks now. The world was shocked when the videos emerged of Hamas terrorists abducting Shiri and her two children, including four-year-old Ariel. The visible horror as she held her children close. Ohad turned nine years old in Hamas captivity and the family has no clarity on his whereabouts. Reports suggested his mother's mobile phone was traced to Gaza. They are among 30 children held hostage in the Gaza Strip out of 203 captives, according to Israeli authorities. Time is rushing. There's a nine-month baby and a three-year-old child, and my aunt has Parkinson's disease. I want them back. We all want our family back. And I cannot think about them over there. I don't know if the baby was fed. I don't know if he got his diaper, he doesn't eat. Thank you. Thank you. This video of the family held hostage in their home was live streamed by the Hamas. <laughs> Relatives fear the girls were abducted by Hamas into the Gaza Strip. 15-year-old Daphna Elikim and 8-year-old sister Ella. Their story is no different from Doron, Raz and Avi Vasher. Doron's husband Yoni saw a video of them being loaded onto a truck and later traced her mobile phone to the Gaza Strip. Peaceful rallies were organized across the Western world demanding release of the hostages. From London to Berlin, the crowd chanted in solidarity for the hostages. Bring them home! Bring them home! Bring them A group of mothers set up an installation of empty strollers in front of the parliament in London to show support to the Israeli families who've had their children taken hostage by the Hamas. After the release of two American citizens, pressure is building up on the Israeli government to get the hostages released soon. <laughs> Israeli Jewish celebrities like Gal Gadot and Maim Balik regularly sharing videos to spread awareness and keep these names in public memory. Social media campaigns are on highlighting the demand with the hashtag bring them back now and release the hostages. October 7th massacre was not the only tragedy to hit Israel with 1,400 civilians brutally and selectively targeted where even children were not spared. But now, Israeli families continue to wait for the return of their loved ones, especially the little ones caught in the Israel-Hamas war. Bureau Report, India Today. Freedom now! Freedom now! Thanks for watching this special broadcast with me, Shiv Arur. We will continue to report from Israel, from the West Bank and the front lines of the Gaza Strip. Remember... As war reporters, it is our job to show you what's happening on the ground and we will continue to do so. Thanks very much for watching. The news continues here on India Today.